to say, I guess, on behalf of the National Board of Cardiography and the Society of Cardiovascular Anesthesiologists, and you even actually have the next president of the American Society of Cardiography, or, or two, two terms here, uh, we, we thank you for involving um, us as well on the other side of the pond, as they say. So thank you very much to the meeting organizers for making this truly an inclusive international meeting. We're, we're very, very um, honored by that. I'm going to be talking about 3D imaging of the aortic valve, a topic that we don't often hear a lot about. These are my disclosures. Uh, first of all, you know, I'm not sure how many people actually use a lot of echocardiography simply for aortic valve replacement. I can tell you as one of the strongest promoters of perioperative echo, often I don't, um, even though we came out with this article showing that for 2D echo, the use of uh, echo routinely in patients undergoing aortic valve replacement changes decision-making 4.4% of the time pre-bypass and 3% of the time post-bypass. But I think you also have to take in consideration when you're using echo in general what the risk-benefit ratio is. However, since this talk is on the aortic valve, I'm certainly going to push for using it. What about 3D echo in general? Well, in terms of it, uh, its role in the popularity contest, I think Madov and his group uh, saw that uh, quite a while ago when they surveyed the world and they said, how often do you use 3D echo routinely in your operating rooms? And the answer was 70 percent, uh, I'm sorry, 40 percent with 70% utilization overall. Uh, this data was collected, I think, in 2012 or so, so I suspect, as the audience here would support, that that um, percentage has gone up quite a bit. But the real question is, does it add qualitative and quantitative value? Let's talk about pretty pictures first. Certainly no doubt that when you look at these pictures, they're beautiful, and certainly if you compare this normal valve, if you will, to a unicuspid, bicuspid, or quadricuspid, it probably doesn't take a whole lot of creativity to understand how this can better help you understand both the geometry and the functional dynamics of these different valves. But one thing you can't do with 2D that you can do with 3D is not only look at these structures in the aortic valve from this perspective, which is the classic short axis uh, view, but you can actually change the displays. So for example, if you take this valve, uh, and instead of looking at it from the aortic root downward, flip it over so that you're looking at it from the ventricle upward, you're sitting in a very special place. You as the viewer are sitting in the left ventricular outflow tract where a lot of stuff happens. This is where SAM happens, where hokum happens, this is where subaortic membranes happen. And I can tell you if you think of the aortic apparatus as not only the valve, but everything from the left ventricular outflow tract up through the root, Understanding this part of the aortic apparatus is important. For example, we do a lot of hokum surgery, which requires myomectomies, and it's important to understand this very, very important part that sits just below the aortic valve, especially when patients present with both aortic stenosis and hokum at the same time. There are a number of measurements I like to make routinely in these patients, the maximum thickness of the septum, the distance of the maximum thickness from the annulus, and how far that thickness extends into the left ventricle. But one view that you can't get with 2D that you can with 3D is this coronal cut. And this is a cut where you're sitting again in the aortic root, but I've cropped up the aortic valve, so you're looking right into the left ventricular outflow tract. And this is this thickened portion of that ventricular septum from the lateral side to the medial side. You can't get this view with 2D alone. And I can tell you when myectomies don't work, this is what the part of the septum that the surgeons are reluctant to excise, right there. And the reason is that area right there is right between the right coronary cusp and the non-coronary cusp, and what sits just below that is the AV node and the ventricular membrane septum. So for example, when you have a myectomy that doesn't work, it may look like this. We see a big bite taken out. But you see that big chunk right there that they left? That's right below the right cusp and the non-coronary cusp. Now the good news for this case is the SAM that was presented pre-op was no longer present post-op. So we didn't go after this little chunk, but if there was a residual gradient, we could pinpoint for the surgeon exactly where that was. It's in a dangerous place, but so be it. That's the difference between an echo cardiographer and an echo, uh, echo anesthesiologist. All right, I showed you pretty pictures. What about the quantitative stuff? Well, let's break this down, first of all, in terms of thinking about 3D echo and aortic stenosis, and then we'll go on to aortic insufficiency, Peravalvular leaks, dynamic stuff, etc. But I want to 